Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for this Tuesday, May 26th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Our New Testament reading today is from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. As they heard these things, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Yeah, that's a parable that's going to take more than the couple minutes that, that we have uh, during evening prayer. Um, I think this will be one of the texts in our summer sermon series we're going to do this year, which is going to be the hard sayings of Jesus, and definitely this one here. Uh, because Jesus' parables don't always mean what we think they mean on the surface. So when he's talking about someone getting, someone who has much getting more, 
He was really talking about the things of the kingdom of God, not the things of the world. So that'll be one of the texts we touch on this summer. We're going to go through a lot of Jesus's uh, more difficult sayings. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is the beginning of Article 3 of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, just as Article 2 was quite short, uh, Article 3 is quite long, uh, but dividing it into three pieces is a little too much because there's not a good logical break. So this is a little longer reading than we've had, but Article 3 of the Apostles' Creed is probably the best uh, part of the large catechism, in my opinion. So let's listen to Luther. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I cannot connect this article, as I have said, to anything better than sanctification. Through this article, the Holy Spirit, with his office, is declared and shown. He makes people holy. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Therefore, we must take our stand upon the term Holy Spirit because it is so precise and complete that we cannot find another. For there are many kinds of spirits mentioned in the Holy Scriptures, such as the spirit of man, 1 Corinthians 2.11, heavenly spirits, Hebrews 12.23, and evil spirits, Luke 7.21. But God's Spirit alone is called the Holy Spirit, that is, he who has sanctified and still sanctifies us. For just as the Father is called Creator and the Son is called Redeemer, so the Holy Spirit from his work must be called sanctifier, or one who makes holy. But how is such sanctifying done? Answer, the Son receives dominion by which he wins us through his birth, death, resurrection, and so on. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit causes our sanctification by the following. The communion of saints, or the Christian church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That means he leads us first into his holy congregation and places us in the bosom of the church. Through the church, he preaches to us and brings us to Christ. Neither you nor I could ever know anything about Christ or believe on him and have him for our Lord, unless it were offered to us and granted to our hearts by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 12.3, Galatians 4.6 The work of redemption is done and accomplished, John 19.30. Christ has acquired and gained the treasure for us by his suffering, death, resurrection, and so on. Colossians 2.3 But if the work remained concealed so that no one knew about it, then it would be useless and lost. So that this treasure might not stay buried but be received and enjoyed, God has caused the word to go forth and be proclaimed. In the word, he has it the Holy Spirit to bring this treasure home and make it our own. Therefore, sanctifying is just bringing us to Christ so we receive this good, which we could not get ourselves, 1 Peter 3.18. Learn then to understand this article most clearly. You may be asked, what do you mean by the words, I believe in the Holy Spirit? You can then answer, I believe that the Holy Spirit makes me holy as his name implies. But how does he accomplish this, or what are his method and means to this end? Answer, by the Christian Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. For in the first place, the Spirit has his own congregation in the world, which is the mother that conceives and bears every Christian through God's word. Galatians 4.26 Through the word he reveals and preaches, he illumines and enkindles hearts, so that they understand, accept, cling to, and persevere in the word. 1 Corinthians 2.12 where the Spirit does not cause the word to be preached and roused in the heart so that it is understood, it is lost. Matthew 13, 19. This was the case under the papacy, where faith was entirely put under the bench. No one recognized Christ as his Lord or the Holy Spirit as his sanctifier. That is, no one believed that Christ is our Lord in the sense that he has gained this treasure for us without our works and merit. Romans 4, 6. And made us acceptable to the Father. What then was lacking? This. The Holy Spirit was not there to reveal it and cause it to be preached, but men and evil spirits were there. They taught us to obtain grace and be saved by our works. There is no Christian church in that, for where Christ is not preached, there is no Holy Spirit who creates, calls, and gathers the Christian church, without which no one can come to Christ the Lord. 
Let this be enough about the sum of this article, but since the parts that are numbered here are not quite clear to the simple, we shall go over them also. The Creed calls the Holy Christian Church a communion of saints. Both expressions taken together are identical. But in the past, the expression communion of saints was not there. This phrase has been poorly and unwisely translated into the German as a communion of saints. If it is to be rendered plainly, it must be expressed quite differently in a German way. In the same way, the word ecclesia properly means in German a gathering, but we are used to seeing it translated as the word church, by which the simple do not understand a gathered multitude, but the consecrated house or building. This is true even though the house ought not to be called a church, just because the multitude gathers there. For we who gather there make and choose for ourselves a particular place and give a name to the house according to the gathering. So the word church really means nothing other than a common gathering, and is not really German but Greek, as is also the word ecclesia. For in their own language the Greeks call it kyria, as in Latin it is called curia. Therefore, in real German, in our mother tongue, it ought to be called a Christian congregation or gathering, or, best of all and most clearly, holy Christendom. So also the word communio, which is added, ought not to be translated communion, but congregation. It is nothing else than an interpretation or explanation by which someone meant to show what the Christian church is. Our people understood, understood neither Latin nor German. They have translated this word communion of saints, although no German dialect says this or understands it this way. But to speak correct German, it ought to be a congregation of saints, that is, a congregation made up purely of saints, or, to speak yet more plainly, a holy congregation. I say this in order that the words communion of saints may be understood. The expression has become so established by custom that it cannot be cast aside easily, and it is treated almost as heresy if someone attempts to change a word. But this is the meaning and substance of this addition. I believe that there is upon earth a little holy group and congregation of pure saints, under one head, even Christ. Ephesians 1.22 This group is called together by the Holy Spirit in one faith, one mind, and understanding, with many different gifts, yet agreeing in love without sects or schisms. Ephesians 4, 5 to 8 and 11. I am also a part and member of this same group, a sharer and joint owner of all the goods it possesses. Romans 8, 17. I am brought to it and incorporated into it by the Holy Spirit through having heard and continuing to hear God's word. Galatians 3, 1 and 2. Which is the beginning of entering it. In the past, before we had attained to this, we were altogether of the devil, knowing nothing about God and about Christ. So until the last day, the Holy Spirit abides with the Holy Congregation or Christendom. And that is where we will end tonight, tomorrow. Uh, we'll back up a paragraph or two, and then we'll finish it. It's about the same length. It's good stuff. Now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. 
Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for our confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we struggle here below with divisions among us, searching for peace among men, remind us daily of the peace of heaven purchased through the bloody death and triumphant resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, your mercy attends us all of our days. Be our strength and support amid the wearisome changes of this world, and at life's end, grant us your promised rest and the full joys of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I ask that you forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night. Thank you.